strategies for spreading out over the landscape. The visions of a low energy future, agrarian rootedness, and low density demographics. Uh, essentially, what I'm going to say, uh, I want to start out talking a little bit about, about history. Uh, and I want to uh, kind of question this idea that civilization uh, is always urban based. Uh, I want to question this idea that that the, when we talk about civilizations, when we read history, when we uh, discuss, you know, uh, all of the great moments, uh, when, whether it be the, the ancient Egypt or the rise and fall of Rome, there's always this idea that the, the, the apex of human uh, society, that, you know, the high points that we have is, are these brief moments in time when certain group, groups of people, when certain groups of, uh, uh, of regions come together and create a, a urban civilization that is very, very, uh, I guess you could say temporal. It's, it's not something that lasts. It's not something that is, that is lasting. Um, it, they generally rise and fall in, in relatively short periods of time. Uh, but the word, the way that we speak about these places is very, very uh, value-laden. For example, when we talk about civilizations, uh, we're assuming that the people who lived in these, that the, the people who created this type of urban empire, essentially, were civilized. In every other civilization or every other group of people, every other form of societal organization, uh, if they did not adopt this urban empire-based uh, growth, are uncivilized. And when in English, when we talk about civilized versus uncivilized, uh, it's not we're not just discussing how people organize their societies. We're putting value to that. Uh, and I think that one of the first things that we need to do before we can start talking about how we can spread out over the landscape, how humanity can respond to the very real crises we're facing, whether it be ecological crises, social crises. Before we can start to talk about that, I think it's important to take a historical perspective and understand that the vast majority of people throughout history have been rural people, people who have lived sustainable, uh, land-based, subsistence, uh, agrarian uh, lifestyles. Um, you know, th throughout history and, and throughout history, there's always been people who have willingly left uh, these areas of, of urban civilization. So uh, what I want to start with, uh, this is a great, this is a, a map uh, of Guatemala. This is El Salvador where I live. But Guatemala is, is known as uh, the Mayan kingdom. Uh, today, there's still about 60 to 65 percent of the population in modern day Guatemala is made up of 23 different Mayan ethnic groups. Um, but I don't know if you all remember about 10 years ago, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of kind of popular news articles about the fall or the, the prophecies uh, of the Mayan Empire and supposedly that the world was going to end in 2012 or something like that, if it's exactly the date it was supposed to be, due to some of the, the old calendars, uh, the astronomical calendars of the Mayan people. But one of the things I was living in, in this uh, area here, this green area, uh, this, uh, this is the traditional territory here of the Mayan Ixil people, I-X-I-L. Um, and one of the things that was interesting is when there was all of this global interest in the Mayan uh, civilizations of the past, uh, you know, people always talked about, oh, the Mayan people were so smart. The Mayan people had all of these great technological advancements. They had all of this great uh, wisdom about, uh, you know, the cosmos, the universe, all of these ways of keeping time. The Mayans were the first ones to discover and use the mathematical concept of zero. Uh, and while I was living there, people started to say, why do they always refer to us in uh, the past tense? Why do they say the Mayan people were, the Mayan people did, the Mayan people used to? Because from the perspective of these people who lived here, uh, they never stopped existing. The Mayans uh, of today are direct descendants of the Mayans of the ancient civilizations of, uh, you know, 2000 years ago. And for example, one of the, the examples of the Mayan Ishio people is that, uh, you know, archaeological investigations have shown that they are direct descendants from Tikal. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Tikal is probably the, one of the largest Mayan cities up here in the jungles of Paten. Uh, and about 2,500 years ago, uh, you know, the, the direct descendants of the Mayan Ishio people probably felt that the big cities, the urban empires of Tikal were growing too big. Uh, there was too much complexity. Uh, there was maybe some food shortages. Maybe there were certain issues with climate change, irregular rainfall, um, whatever it might be. And they just simply decided to leave. And there's rivers uh, that go through the jungles here. 
and, and they eventually ended up in the in this beautiful, beautiful area of, of, of mountainous landscape. Uh, and they've lived there uninterrupted, essentially, for about 2,500 years. Obviously, uh, during colonization and then, uh, you know, more recent events with uh, the globalization, you know, they've, 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 they've obviously been contacted as an uncontacted tribe. But these people maintain their traditions, maintain their forms of governance, their traditional forms of growing food, uh, obviously their language, their traditional dress, and they never cease to exist. The Mayan Empire, you know, the, the empires of Tikal, uh, uh, of Copan, of all of these large cities, rose and fell. And we have these great, wonderful monuments we can go visit, you know, the nice pyramids and things like that. But the example, you know, but the people themselves continue. And throughout history, we see this tendency all the time that civilizations rise and fall. You know, the Romans, we talked, I think in the last class that I left, we talked, we, we, we gave an interesting example of Rome. Rome rose and it fell. It took 400 years. Uh, you know, several, several generations to eventually fail. Um, but that's not to say that there are, you know, the people themselves didn't work. As Rome fell, what's known as the barbarians, uh, it, you know, Rome didn't fall because they were invaded by barbarians, generally. It's more true that they lost so much of their population because people learned that, you know, this urban civilization is failing. You know, it became too complex, it became too big too hard to manage. And so what people did is they essentially simply spread out over the landscape. You know, in, in the case of Rome, a lot of the people who lived in Rome and of the big cities and the, peri the periphery uh, of this great urban civilization said, it would be better for us to live with the barbarians. And they became barbarians, which is essentially to say they moved out in the countryside. They, a lot of them uh, became semi-nomadic until they settled again in some other place uh, where there was more of an agrarian farming, small farming lifestyle. And again, throughout history, this is always what happens. People, you know, the civilizations rise and fall, but it's always, you know, they, all of these people, like the Mayan issue people who return to the land, those who maintain traditional subsistence, agrarian, farming lifestyles uh, that maintain humanity, that maintain society. So yes, there's obviously great things we can say about these urban civilizations and all that we've learned through science and the arts and things like that. But they are prone to rise and fall. And our own civilization, as we said in the past class, is following, uh, you know, we're bound to follow, you know, that same pattern. We're not necessarily exempt from history, right? Um, so though these people who move out into the, to the peripheries, who move out into, uh, into the landscape, who spread out over the landscape and maintain kind of a low pro profile, although they are largely undocumented, it is these land-based peoples who have generally maintained human civilization, human society. It's that which allows us as a species to continue on. Um, James Scott, uh, I've mentioned him several times in de several different courses. He's an anthropologist, a political scientist, um, and he wrote a book, uh, Against the Grain, uh, that you see here. It, it's uh, the, the, sub the subtitle is A Deep History of the Earliest States. Uh, and one of the things that's fascinating about him is he says, we need to rethink this word, civilization, which is kind of what I was speaking about earlier that civilization implies civility. But throughout hi history, it is often the non-state peoples, the barbarians, the Mayan Ishio people, those people who willingly leave civilization, or sometimes unwillingly, sometimes when things get really bad, they're forced out of, of these urban empires. But it is those peoples who generally show more civility, right? Uh, history is written by the winners, the colonizers, the violent. And they are the ones, the people who have written these histories, who have kind of usurped this idea, who've taken over this idea that civilization, everything great about what it means to be a human being is urban, expansive, colonialist by nature. Uh, this, is, uh, th th this is something I think that we would do well to extract from our mind, or at least to question it, to try and deconstruct it, right? To understand that although, you know, there might be the, the vast majority of people throughout history didn't live in these areas of urban empire, but that's not necessarily to say that they lived bad lives, uh, that they were, uh, you know, that the Thomas Hobbes kind of came up with the idea that everything before, before modernity, people lived lives that were nasty, short, and brutish, uh, were, were some of his words. And, and, and that's, I, I think, false. Um, you know, those of us who have lived amongst rural communities, who have lived on the outside of these urban empires, who have never really enjoyed the benefits of modernity, uh, are generally, you know, th there is a lot to be said for these places where tradition is maintained, where people live simple lifestyles, but lifestyles that are rich in meaning, rich in purpose, uh, 
uh, obviously much more ecologically balanced. Um, and so one of the things that, that James Scott says in his book here, he says that the truth is that staying in one place, which is what civilizations have more or less forced us to do throughout time, wasn't that healthy for us. And our human ancestors resisted it strongly for a very long time. And to this day, there are lots of people who resist this idea that we need to live in urbanized civilizations under the guise of a state. There are still non-state peoples. There are people who, who exist on the peripheries. There are people who exist in areas where states do not have, uh, you know, the idea of civilization, of urban civilization doesn't have hold over them. Now, the question is, what is different between the world we live in today and the world of the Mayan Ishio people. So 2,500 years ago, like I said, the, the, a small tribe of, of, of Mayan people decided that the urban cities of Tikal were becoming too crowded, too messy, too complex, too hard to maintain. And they said, well, we're just gonna grab our canoes, go down the, the river, we're gonna find an empty piece of jungle and create our own little society. Uh, today, I think we have obviously different challenges, you know? There is a lot more of us, right? Uh, we went from 1 billion, you know, less than 1 billion people in pre-industrial times. Uh, and in a couple of decades, we're supposed to top out at 10 billion people. Uh, this is a blip in human history. This demographic kind of like pulse, uh, you know, we, to, to go from 1 billion to 10 billion. And already, you know, demographers are starting to say, we're going to, we're going to return to, you know, uh, you know, we already see in, in many countries, birth rates declining. Uh, you know, populations begin to decline, even places like China. Um, but right now, you know, as we are facing all of these crises, this poly crisis, this meta crisis, they say, uh, of, of having so many people on, on this planet requiring so many different resources and obviously the energy, uh, you know, we're going to, th this is going to be different. We can't just, you know, get into our canoes and go to an empty space. Uh, there's going to be a lot more challenges about spreading out over the landscape, living more simply. Um, there's less space. There's more demand for resources. There's higher expected standards of living. Wendell Berry, who's a farmer and a poet and essayist, who I've quoted many times throughout these courses, uh, he has a great quote in one of his essays. And he says, we must find the courage and develop the skills to live poorer than we do today. And that word right there, poor, I think is a key one because it's something that, that you know, when it, those of us who work in the development industry, the idea is to defeat poverty, right? The idea is to, we need to, we need to do better than poverty. We need to help people progress and, and discover all of the marvels of affluence and comforts and wealth. Um, but what Wendell Berry is saying that there is something good and decent about living simple lifestyles uh, where, Hard work allows people to thrive within the ecological balance of their geographical territories. Now, another issue, uh, you know, another, I think, challenge that we're going to face as we, uh, you know, slowly as the, the, the current urban, globalized, industrial civilization in which we live, as that starts to unravel, another challenge we're going to face is that for the first time in human history, a majority of people no longer have the skill, the knowledge, and the abilities related to how to live a land-based livelihood. When the Mayan Ishio people got in the canoes and sailed down, the vast majority of them knew how to grow their own corn, grow their own beans, they could uh, build their own homes, they could source firewood, they knew where to find uh, you know, streams and, and creeks for fresh water, they knew how to recycle their wastes back into the fertility of their land. All of these really, really important uh, skills that are required for living, for, for sustaining ourselves. Today, uh, you know, James Scott again says, when we moved from hunting and gathering you know, 20,000 years ago to working on an assembly line, you know, one of the big changes is that that has made us much more machine-like and less attuned to the world around us. Because in today's economy, you know, in this, in this modern day industrial globalized society, people only have to be skilled at one thing, right? An electrician only knows how to how to fix electrical outlets. A plumber only knows how to fix uh, uh, you, you know plumbing. Uh, a person who works in a bank only knows how to know you know certain things about finance. Uh, a lawyer needs to know about law. Uh, and the idea is that you exchange that knowledge, which is very specific, very limited, for all of the other things you need to survive. Uh, and I'm not saying that there's not a need for lawyers and in uh, nurses and doctors and all of these specialized electricians, plumbers, but the 
fact remains that for the first time in millions of years, probably since humans began, uh, you know, most people don't have the practical skills needed for sustenance. And I think that's, that's something we need to consider and think about. Um, and another thing that I think that I've mentioned several times, and I've already mentioned it, is that we have uh, developed in you know, modern day societies a complete aversion to the idea uh, of work and manual labor. And this is something that can, the educational systems can be extremely uh, criticized for, because it's this idea that you go to study so that you no longer have to work with your body, right? You don't have to use your hands, your muscles, uh, and obviously, you know, this is translated in the developed countries of the world, the United States and Europe and other places where, you know, the vast majority of people are overweight and suffering from chronic diseases such as obesity and diabetes and heart disease and all these things. And now, you know, people find that in the United States, you know, probably 50 percent of people are spending, you know, however much money each month to go to the gym because they need to do something physically. But the idea that, you know, we study, we become professionalized so that we no longer have to work. Uh, you know, physically with our bodies uh, and spreading out of the landscape, this idea of returning to a land-based livelihood doesn't mean that we're not going to have need for doctors and nurses and professionals, but it might mean that more people are going to be more directly involved with the hard work of sustaining human lives, farming, uh, forestry, uh, building homes, Whatever, whatever it might be, the things that we need, shelter, food, water, fuel, warmth, those types of things. And Wendell Berry again says, one of the things that we need to do is we need to urgently question this really, really deeply entrenched cultural assumption that all hard work is equal to drudgery. And that, I don't know if, if that word is widely used everywhere, but I think it's a great word. Hard work is not the same as drudgery. Drudgery for me would be working on an assembly line 10 hours a day doing the same repetitive motion. Uh, but many people accept that. Uh, drudgery, hard work is being involved, being, uh, you know, being what, 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 what a lot of the people in rural communities continue to do today, you know, to be directly involved in the sustenance of your livelihood, participating in the lives of the community. Um, here the question is, but do we have any choice but to return to the land? Um, I think I... I, I shared a quote in the past class from an author that I, I really like called David Fleming. Uh, and he wrote a lot about localization, about the need to return to local economies. And he said that something, I think the quote says that localization is hard to imagine. It's hard to think about how we're going to move from globalized economies back to local economies. It's impossible to think about how that's going to happen sometimes, but it has one advantage. That is the only realistic path forward kind of what he says. So I think, you know, obviously, you know, with all of these, this poly crisis, this meta crisis, which is, you know, we have food uh, problems, uh, 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 growing enough food for our, for our population, we have declining returns on yields, we have immense amounts of loss of topsoil, which is, you know, uh, essential for growing food for or a growing population. Uh, there's water scarcity, water stress, obviously all of the problems of global climate change, social instability with wars in the Middle East, wars in Russia and Ukraine, uh, fighting here and there, uh, growing inequality between the top 1% and the bottom 90%. We have ecological imbalance. Fossil fuels are ending. Uh, it is a finite resource. What happens when, when we reach peak oil and we, we, we start to decline having enough uh, you know, fuel to to mobilize, to heat our homes, to cool our homes, to you, you know, power the tractors, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, the supply lines of the global economic system are increasingly long and complex. So all these issues that we're facing should, should I think, show us that, look, we need to consider that returning to the landscape, spreading out over the landscape might be the only thing that is realistically available to us. And again, for those of us who work in community development programs, who work in rural areas still yet, unfortunately, you know, one, of the, one of the reasons that my family and I decided to leave uh, the community development industry was because we saw that the vast majority of funding, the vast majority of projects were focused on extracting people from rural areas. There's this idea that, that rural areas are backwards and, and, and development should be about inserting people into the monetary economy. 
should be about forcefully removing them, not, not by force necessarily, but through education, through stimulus, through uh, you know, th th this whole cultural assumption that urban life is better, that the more money you make, the happier you're going to be, and, 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 and finding ways to, to essentially remove people, especially young people, from these rural areas so that they can have more money. Uh, and, and we thought that the opposite was true, that living in rural areas, in agrarian communities, spread out of the landscape, living simply, but finding ways to live ever more dignified lives, that that's what uh, the future, uh, that's what we needed to do. That's where goodness was as well. Um, I guess real quick, another thing that I think is that, uh, you know, another challenge to, to spreading out of the landscape is that the exact opposite is happening today. You know, we are becoming increasingly urban uh, in some parts of the world. I'm currently visiting my family in the United States here. 80% uh, of people live in urban areas. Uh, worldwide, I think we recently passed, passed the 50% plateau. Uh, I think we're around 55% of people live in urban areas. Uh, Chris Smage is a, is, a, is a great author uh, based in the UK that writes a lot about this. And he says that, this is a quote from a recent book of his, the fact is more or less that every region does have the right soil and climate for growing food of some kind. But it's true that the present geographical distribution of the world's population is not conducive for many people to source the food locally. If everyone living in Lund, for example, for example, immediately had to meet their staple food needs from, from within a hundred kilometer radius, they'd starve in short order. Just because, you know, obviously when you have enormous amounts of people living in one place, and we have, I forget how many hundreds of cities that, are, that have crossed the 100 million or the 1 million uh, population threshold, but that obviously requires, you know, in, uh, you know, greater peripheries, right? That's why Rome expanded and expanded because as these urban areas grow, uh, you, you know, continue to grow, they had to go farther out, conquer more peoples, uh, conquer more lands. And the same thing happens today. So the more that we urbanize and conglomerate people into, into small spaces, you know, the more we rely on fossil fuels to ship in food and fuel and water, um, and, you know, if that system breaks down, if this globalized supply lines break down, like, like he says, people are going to starve. There's going to be huge issues about how to, how, to, uh, what, how to deal with millions of people living in small areas, right? And that, again, spreading out of the landscape, like he says, you know, every region can grow certain types of food, whether you grow in, you know, deserts or cold regions or tropical jungles. You know, one, one of the amazing things about the world we live in is that there is this enormous productivity that the, that the, that the earth provides. Uh, and every you know, you know, past uh, indigenous civilization found ways to grow food, uh, to sustain themselves, even in the harshest environments, you know, from the Arctic, uh, you know, all of the Inuit civilizations that lived in these cold, barren places to people who lived in deserts, wh wherever it might be, people, you know, there, is way, there are ways for uh, you know, local geographies to sustain people. The problem today, again, with the urbanization is that it requires enormous energetic inputs, which is fossil fuels. Um, and when that energy surplus comes under strain, uh, most cities will crumble. Um, and most people, you know, William Reese is a human ecologist. He looks at human societies from an ecological lens. And he says that cities are dissipative structures. Or said in more popular language, cities are essentially human feedlots. It's kind of the same idea of, I don't know if you, if you all in your countries have these, this, the problem with these huge uh, feed, feedlots, um, essentially concentrating cows or chickens or pigs, you know, into these massive farms where they have, uh, here in the United States, it's tens of thousands of, of cattle. Uh, and the problem is when you have all these cattle in one place, you have to ship in food from them. They're not eating grass like they're supposed to, you know, you have to ship them in grain. And then they have this huge problem with all of this waste, essentially all of this cow poop that now they have to deal with. And so, it, you know, in when cows are spread out over the landscape, they can be an extremely regenerative part of the landscape. So, for example, in, in here in the United States, you know, the bison, which were kind of the precursors to, to cattle today, you know, roamed these massive plains, uh, the, these huge prairies in the Midwest, uh, and they built up the soil by, by moving through the landscape. These prairies stored millions and millions of tons of carbon dioxide in the soils through years of growing and then, and then dying out and growing and dying out. So all the, this, this soil-based carbon uh, was obviously captured and stored in the, in the landscape. 
Uh, and then obviously, you know, the, the, the manure from the bison, uh, it, it wasn't a problem. It fell, it was decomposed by dung beetles and other animals, and it came back as part of the soil, helped more grass to grow, more prairie grasses to grow. The problem is, is when you concentrate these animals in one place, it becomes an ecological disaster and you require to bring in energy uh, you know, through food uh, into to, to sustain these animals and you have to do something to take all of this waste out of that place. And that's essentially what cities are. It's a dissipative structure. Um, real quick, other, some of the other problems with, with urban civilization that we face today uh, is that economic globalization is extremely complex. Uh, in one of the last classes that I shared, uh, we talked about uh, Joseph Tainter, uh, whose book on, on the collapse of, of complex societies makes the argument that one of the reasons that civilizations fail is because there is a returning or a diminishing return on societal complexity. So essentially, as things become more complex, you know, as cities grow and supply lines become longer, more globalized, more difficult, there comes a time when people say, hey, look, this is just too complex. We're going to stop spread out over the landscape, return to a more elegant, but more uh, simple type of lifestyle where there's not all of these intermediaries between me and my needs, my, my direct human needs, right? Um, like I said, you know, today we are, uh, the, the energetic and material basis for the complexity of, of global industrial civilization is waning. The 80% urban population that we have, and we have less than 5% farmers. In many parts of the world, such as here in the United States, it's, to, it's about 1%. Uh, that's dangerous. It's very dangerous. As, and the other thing is that as people have been removed from working landscapes and from the natural world, you know, we've become deficient in the kinds of material experiences that normally define the human condition, right? You know, even during, during the Roman periods, there might have been, you know, some upper classes who were uh, completely shielded from having to you know, do any sort of manual labor. But the vast majority of people who lived in Rome of those days probably went out into the fields to grow some of their own wheat, right? Or at least they knew how to, they probably take care, took care of their own, uh, you know, farm animals and things like that. But we have lost that. The lack of time spent outdoors, interacting with the environment, with the natural world in physically, physically constructive ways has led to certain gaps in our mental models. You know, for the first time, you know, I was born into a generation, many of you as well, perhaps, where we simply do not know how the world functions. We do not know how to provide for ourselves. We don't know where food comes from, where water comes from. Uh, you know, young people today, if you ask them, where does water come from? They'll say, from the tap. Where does food come from? Well, food comes from the grocery store. Uh, where does energy come from? I don't know. I just turn on a light, uh, flick a switch, and the light bulb comes on. You know, that mental model is deficient in the sense that it's not real. You know, we don't know what's behind that. And because of the complexity of the supply line, you know, most of us are not able to, to, to deal with that, right? Even something as, as basic as human waste. You ask a young child today, what happens uh, with, uh, you know, when you go to the bathroom? Well, I don't know. I just, I flush the, flush the toilet and it's done and, and out of sight, out of mind, right? Um, but if those systems were to start to break down, you know, are we going to be able to teach people, you know, the skills needed to deal with everything from how to procure the food we need to survive to how to deal with the waste that comes out of our own bodies? Um, so what awaits us? Uh, there is a really great study that came out in 2019 uh, called The Future is Rule. You can find it online. Um, it's from, uh, I forget the name of the institution, I'm sorry. But it, it, it essentially, food, at, food system adaptations to the great simplification. And they make the argument that, look, uh, all of the things that we just talk, talked about, you know, the decline in fossil hydrocarbon fuels, flows, the inability of renewable energies to really fully substitute, is going to create a, a deficiency of energy to the power bloated urban agglomerations and will require a shift of human populations back to the countryside. In short, the future is rural. And, and their focus is more on energy, right? I would say that maybe you can make the same uh, argument for, for farming as uh, soils continue to become depleted, as fertility is lost in soils, people are going to be forced to, to return to uh, more agrarian livelihoods and participate in, 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 the, in the long, good, good hard work process of growing food while not destroying soils, right? Uh, that, you know, I guess you could say, you know, all of these declines in this global industrial civilization are going to uh, essentially force people to move back into rural areas. And again, 
those of us who work in development, if we if we if we take a real analysis of what we're facing, what we're in, in all the challenges we're going to face, I think we might need to rethink you know, how these development projects are, many of which are unfortunately going against you know this idea that, that yes, there's all these problems, but let's just continue to to help people. Uh, move away from these traditional based livelihoods and into urban centers and and introduce them into mon into the monetary economy, even if that means the loss of traditional livelihoods, traditional knowledge. No, I think that if we're if we're serious about the, the challenges that we face, then we also have to be serious about some of the solutions, right? Uh, and that's what I want to talk about. Yeah, here, one more, and then I'm good for the next one. Uh, so what will this re-ruralization entail? If, if in many parts of the world, we're going to re-ruralize, then those parts of the of, of the world where there is still a strong uh, rural population, we need to do everything we can to sustain that. Um, the most basic thing is that many more of us are going to need to be responsible for food security, right? We're going to have to participate in growing our own food. This is a picture here uh, of a small town that I visited uh, a couple weeks ago, no, about a week and a half ago, uh, here in the United States. And I don't know if, if you all know, uh, you know, Unfortunately, in the United States and many, most other uh, uh, urban area or, or developed countries, you know, there's a home and in front of the home, there is an enormous amount of grass, the, the idea of lawns. And it's amazing. You look at the, the amount of space that is essentially wasted. And, and the thing is that there's an enormous amount of gasoline that is used just to, just to mow the, yawn, the, the, the lawn, the yard. Uh, and most people don't really ever spend time in it. And there's a small town here in, uh, in North Carolina that I went to visit. Where uh, you know people wanted to grow their own food, they wanted to, they wanted to participate. But actually, the local town, the the the, the local laws uh, prohibited people because of supposed aesthetic reasons uh, from from growing food in their front yards. They could do it in the backyards, but not in the front yards. Many people didn't have a backyard, so eventually they 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 you know went to the town hall and were able to reverse this kind of backward legislation. And the idea is that you know many more people need to be involved. In this, you know, taking the space around our homes, growing what we can, learning the, the basic art of growing food, because food, it's scarcity. The desire and opportunity to grow it and need to do it in ways that are appropriate in place and circumstance are going to be some of the major drivers of the demographic shifts in this century. You know, when you when you live in an urban city and you go to the grocery store and you start to see that it's harder and harder to get what you need, or the prices get higher and higher or you have to wait more, longer and longer to get what you need, people are going to start to see that. And they're going to start to say, well, maybe we should rethink this, right? Maybe we need to, to return to places where food does not come from supermarkets. Food comes from the soil. Food comes from the hard work that we, that we do. So if we are working in areas where we need to spread out over the landscape, how can we do that? You know, what are some of the strategies for doing that? So spreading out of the landscape, um, th this is an, a, an interesting example. This is a, a picture of a village uh, in Europe. Um, you look at these areas and you think that 200 years ago, the vast majority of human civilization lived in areas like this. And one of the things that's always fascinating to me is I always you know, come across these news articles uh, about villages like this in Europe that have essentially been abandoned. So lots of you know, small mayors and you know, these small mountain towns in Italy and in Spain and they're essentially dying towns because all the young people have moved away. They're all moved to the city. And they're, you know, you, you hear these articles about people, about these urban mayors essentially giving away a house. All you have to do is go and live there because they want more population. And I think that that's fascinating because I think that, you know, that's exactly what is going to happen in the coming years. That these places where you still have land, where you still have water, where you still have soil to grow stuff, you know, are, are, are going to become, you know, that, that, that's where people are going to are going to want to migrate to instead of migrating to the city. So as we spread out of the landscape, as we relearn the skills to live off the land, this will allow us to build homesteads and village that rely on dispersed solar energy. I think that's really important, right? So dispersed solar energy is essentially, you know, what every living creature on this earth depends on. The sun creates photosynthesis, begins the food chain in, 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 in motion. And what we, what we, what we in, in our urban modern civilization depend on today is concentrated fossil energy. Unfortunately, concentrated fossil energy is uh, being depleted. And of course, it, it causes all these issues with you know, global climate change. So for example, that would mean 
for growing food using draft animals instead of tractors. Tractors run on oil, on gas. Draft animals such as oxen and, and, and horses, they rely on dispersed solar energy, which is essentially grass that grows through photosynthesis, that they eat that, and then they, use, they turn that into energy that will be used for growing food. The same thing, cement blocks versus adobe. Adobe can be sourced locally with the, the, the energy from our own bodies, from our own muscles. Cement blocks require an enormous amount of concentrated fossil fuels. Uh, another thing, smaller towns and cities surrounded by areas of high biocapacity will fare much better than large cities, especially in areas where nature's bounty, ecosystem services are plentiful. Living off the land, learning to re-ruralize, to spread out over the landscape, is essential about learning how to create a culture that makes the most of nature's renewable bounty. And there's a fascinating uh, study out there about, here are two cities, Flint, Michigan and Orlando, Florida. And it's interesting, Flint, Michigan is kind of an example of this rundown, uh, poor city where there's lots of violence, lots of issues. Orlando is this booming metropolis. Uh, but a lot of these studies say that, look, in the long run, Flint, Michigan is much better poised to return to sustainable ways of livelihood than Orlando, Florida. And the, almost anybody today, if you say, where are you going to invest your money if you, you want to build or buy uh, real estate, if you want, everybody's going to want to go to Orlando, Florida because it's a booming economy, there's all this money. It's also located in one of the areas that could be flooded uh, as global sea, uh, uh, sea levels rise. Uh, there's very, very limited amounts of water or, or, or of of, of land to grow things on. It's, it's surrounded by essentially marshes that, that are incompatible with, with human civilization. Whereas Flint, Michigan, despite the fact that, you know, it's kind of an urban run down, poor, violent place today, you know, it's surrounded by high quality land, uh, farmland. There's an abundance of fresh water throughout the you know, fresh lakes. So when you think about this, again, this is the question, how do we migrate to smaller towns medium-sized cities that are surrounded by areas of high biocapacity, right? So again, you know, an another example that we could say is instead of uh, Orlando, Florida, Las Vegas, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, this huge kind of mirage city in the desert, you know, where the only reason that millions of people can move to Las Vegas is because of the enormous influx of fossil fuels that bring energy, that bring water, uh, et cetera, into these places. Those areas are going to need to be depopulated, right? So we need to think about where can we create new civilizations that rely on the ecosystem services that nature provides um, in, in areas of high biocapacity, you know, where, where nature can take care of us, where it can sustain us. Um, another thing is that our future rural society will rely on greater labor inputs and less reliance on mechanization. So this idea about you know, how can we uh, you know, use correct technology. I, there, I, I did a course uh, a couple months ago about the idea of appropriate technology, right? Uh, and so where it makes sense, we need to stop relying so much on machinery because obviously machinery requires greater material inputs, greater energy inputs, uh, which today means greater fossil fuel use. Uh, machinery lets you do a lot more with less labor, but the reality is we have enough stuff. Instead, let's start using our excess productivity to give people meaningly livelihoods. So that's a, a quote from, from Kenneth Mulder, I think, you know, again, Returning to simpler lifestyles does not necessarily mean less happiness, right? We've talked about this before, that you know, once we reach a certain GDP plateau, there is not, you know, as, as rich economies continue to grow, that does not correspond with greater happiness. Happiness isn't about finding meaningful livelihoods, right? Um, the, eth the ethics of place-based sustainable production methods uh, so this is about strategies for how, how are we going to, to spread out of the landscape. One, we need to try and minimize external inputs, you know, into the in, into our economic cycles. That means tightly cycle nutrients to prevent their leakage. Let's make sure, yeah. Uh, we need to protect and renew soil health. If we're going to be fed by our local bioregion, we need to do so in a way that allows the natural world to continue to to regenerate. The same can be said about all of the resources we use, you know? So if we're not gonna be able to rely on coal and oil and natural gas to heat and cool and power the, 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 the homes that we live in and the businesses that we use, you know, how can we do so, you know, in a way where we can use renewable resources, solar, energy, uh, wood, 
fuels in a way that you know isn't a degenerative but rather regenerative and then you know the last one is that we've talked a lot about is the art of restraint we need to understand that more is not always better that in many cases learning to say no learning to accept limitations and boundaries is one of the fundamental aspects of human culture right you know developing ways to say that we don't need more 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 we can do more with less and we can find happiness in this restraint um so how can we what, what are some other strategies for spreading out over the landscape one we need to be willing to learn from the past right a lot of times it's like the past is something that we need to overcome no the generations that went before us uh, are those who learned the skills about living sustainably land we need to learn from that. ancient human cultures found way, ways to live within their local environments using only you know what we talked about this dispersed solar energy flows if the future is rural if we need to spread out over the landscape in order to continue human society we need to they knew some things that would be useful to us so people in places like the united states might need to seek advice from those people in other parts of the world that haven't fully in industrialized. I think that the true bearers of wisdom today are, you know, aren't these tech geniuses like, like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, you know, the ones who are always in the news. I think we need to, you know, uh, put up on a pedestal, you know, these indigenous cultures that continue uh, to show us how to live sustainably in place. Those are the people, I think, that demonstrate ingenuity uh, and that might keep us from going hungry. Um, we also need to adapt our lifestyles to the regenerative cap capacities of the natural world. Uh, I've, I've talked about this, for example, this is a, a picture of ancient China, um, uh, not ancient China, but, but you know, China several years ago. Uh, and they developed a soil fertility management practice called night soils. Uh, and essentially where all of the small villages and cities, every night there were people who would take these buckets essentially of human excrement and take them out to the agricultural fields, to the rice fields, and mix them in with the soil so that next year's uh, uh, a rice harvest would be sustained. And that allowed them to become farmers of 40 centuries. That's a famous book that talks about them. And it's the idea that, look, you know, by adapting these, these lifestyles in these farming practices and these industry practices that allow us to operate within the regenerative capacities of the natural world you know, we can sustain cultures in place. And we need to learn about that. We need to find new ways to do that. Another example is, you know, the forest communities, people who live like you know, up in the, the, the mountains, in the jungles of, 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 of Central America, where I live, there are forest communities that have been harvesting the same forest for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it continues to exist. Whereas in our Western idea, we come in and we clear cut a forest and it's done and over. No, by, lo by learning to identify you know, what trees need to be cut down so that others can regrow. We can manage a, a resource in a sustainable way. Uh, we also need to, two more, two more. We also need to adapt new practices that arise from our unique predicament. Um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about in, in past classes about permaculture, about agroecology, um, about all of these new, not new ideas, but you know, these really smart uh, strategies that come from science, that come from uh, th this mixture of, of scientific knowledge today and traditional knowledge from people around there about, about how we can respond to the specific challenges that industrialism has created. So for example, how can we um, develop civil pasture systems, use biointensive methods to grow more vegetables, uh, shift to perennial tree crops, uh, in intensify our production in a way uh, that like what we've talked about in permaculture, permaculture that accelerates the natural succession of the world while allowing us to uh, to enjoy food crops. Um, an example here is, um, you know, here where uh, I live, uh, me and several small farmers uh, used to grow potatoes. Uh, potatoes were a hard crop to grow. It's something that we had to do year after year. Um, it did diminish, uh, in a sense, you know, some of the soil fertility. And we've recently started to go chacha fruto, uh, which is an interesting, very interesting tree crop where in, in, in the Colombian Andes Mountains, where it's uh, originally from, it's called the tree potato, and it's essentially a, a tree crop that grows a, 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 a vegetable uh, that tastes remarkably like potato. If you, if you were blindfolded, you probably couldn't tell the distance. difference. The difference is that chacha fruto, you plant once, it becomes this massive tree, and all of the ecosystem benefits that, 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 that trees allow, whereas potatoes are an annual crop that every year you have to you know, till up the soil, harvest it. A lot of people use 
enormous amounts of chemical inputs. So how can we start to you know, adopt, you know, learn from all of these different cultures to adapt new crops that allow us to, uh, to harvest, to have a yield uh, in, in a sense that doesn't diminish the natural capacities of the world. Uh, and then lastly, I think another thing that's important is cyclicality, right? How can we avoid this modern tendency that we have today where we consume, 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 uh, and then we throw out our wastes, right? The idea of, of a linear economic model, which is what we have today, right? Where, you know, you, we, you know, some major mine extracts resources, it's sent to the manufacturing center where it's turned into a product, which is then shipped to a major store. And then the consumer purchases that item, uh, uses it generally for a very short amount of time and throws it away and ends up in a landfill. That's a, that's a, a, a linear model. Uh, and, and, and that model is coming to an end, right? We are running out of resources, running out of energy, and it can't continue. And one of the things about as we spread out over the landscape, obviously, you know, we can't just go to Walmart or go, you know, shop on Amazon or whatever it might be to get what we need. And so cyclicality is about how to maintain all of these resources. So, for example, food waste, you know, from whatever we're, we're cutting up to eat for lunch becomes hog feed. The hog waste, the, the, the manure from the from the from the pigs enters a bio di biogas digester. We take that, that biogas and we heat our home uh, or we heat a greenhouse. Uh, and, and then the digestate from that bio digester fertilizes crops. It is to continue using all of the resources that we have uh, in a cyclical manner as much as possible. It is.